Tonight for you, the world's favorite romance. This is Orson Welles, speaking to you only after a low bow to the memory of Henry Miller and James O'Neill and all the rest of his betters who've played the wonderful, mysterious gentleman from Corsica before him. Of the author, of Alexander Dumas, who wrote Monte Cristo, there is no reasonable explanation. Dumas was a rich man. We note with interest that he went bankrupt in the theater. He was a revolutionary. His grandfather was a marquis. His grandmother was a negress. He was born as Napoleon became emperor. He died in poverty as the Germans marched into France. He wrote The Count of Monte Cristo as a newspaper serial. And shortly after the last installment, a ball and a bullfight were organized for him in Seville. And finally, in Algiers, the customs man let his baggage through without examination. Such things don't and can't happen today. But then neither does Alexander Dumas himself, the wildest romance of a man who could and did openly maintain at 70 numerous establishments and a literary factory as well whose quantitative output is equal in the arts only by the fabulous studio of Rubens. There's a good story about what Dumas Pair told Dumas Feast. Father, said the inventor of Camille, I have just read your latest book. Have you, my son, said Dumas, fair? What's it about? I'm not sure I have. It's no secret and no shame either that the Chateau Monte Cristo was haunted by many ghostwriters and that its owner signed his name to more books than anyone could ever write. It is not expected of Pharaoh that he build with his own hands his own pyramids. And the mere blueprint of one Dumas plot is an airtight alibi for a whole career. Of all these plots, out of question, the most gloriously complex, as perfect as watchworks, and as big as Pittsburgh, among all others, one Dumas plot persists as the most ingenious, tall story ever perpetrated by the mind of man. God's vengeance on radio scriptwriters, and your indestructible delight in spite of us. Here, then, is our humble 57 minutes' worth of The Count of Monte Cristo. <laughs> Just before we begin tonight's story, I want to confer the freedom of the microphone upon Ernest Chappell. Thank you, Mr. Wells. Ladies and gentlemen, just the other day I sat down in the dining car of a train. I glanced around the tables near me to see what others were having for dinner. Perhaps you've done the same thing now and then because it sort of gives you an idea, doesn't it? Well, of 16 men and women whose plates I saw there in the diner, 10 were eating chicken. And I found my pencil writing on the order card. <laughs> chicken. Right then and there, I said to myself again, it must be this liking so many of us have for chicken that accounts for the great popularity of Campbell's chicken soup. Because this soup is chicken, through and through, from its golden surface to the very bottom of the plate. Its broth fairly glistens with chicken richness. Its fluffy rice is steeped in chicken flavor. And there are tender pieces of chicken meat in it to further tempt your spoon. That's why I promise you that just as sure as you like chicken, you like Campbell's chicken soup. If you haven't tried it, why don't you? Perhaps at dinner tomorrow night. And now... Oh. present the most popular of men in Paris, the Count of Monte Cristo, the Baroness Montiego. I am deeply honored. 
can't start a trip, though. What is it, Mercedes? Are you ill? No. It's nothing, Fernand. Perhaps the heat of this room. Very kind of the Count to come here tonight. Will you give me your arm, Count Monte Cristo? I am honored, madame. Is it true, Count, what everyone is saying about you in Paris? What are they saying, madame? That you have seen so much. Traveled so far. Suffered so deeply. I have suffered deeply, madame. Now are you happy? No doubt, since no one hears me complain. Your present happiness. Has it softened your heart? My present happiness does not equal my past misery. Are you not married? I am married. No, madame. You're alone, then? I am alone. You have no sister, no father? I have nothing. How can you exist, though, with no one to hold you to life? Madame, a long time ago, I loved a girl. I was on the point of marrying her, madame, when we were separated. I thought she loved me well enough to wait for me and even to remain faithful to my grave. When I returned, she was married. Perhaps my heart was weaker than that of most, and I suffered more than they would have in my place. That is all, madame. And you still preserve this love in your heart? It's true we can love only once. Did you ever see her again? Never. You've forgiven her for all she made you suffer? Yes. I have forgiven her. Do you still hate those that separated you? Do you still want to punish them? They will be punished, madame. But it is not I who will punish them. It is their own past. <laughs> Society had been more intrigued than it was the winter of 1834, when the mysterious Count de Monte Cristo appeared in the city of Paris. It is time now that the world should hear his story. Of the title of this man, nothing was known that winter save that he derived it from a small and uninhabited island off the coast of Corsica. The source of his fortune was equally obscure, and it seemed inexhaustible. The paintings in his house in the Champs Elysees were valued at seven million francs. His collection of precious stones far exceeded in value that of any of the crowned heads of Europe. Yet it was not his wealth alone that made him remarkable. At a dinner party that winter, a woman was heard to say that the Count of Monte Cristo had the look of a man who had been enclosed for a long time in a tomb. I heard her say it. The long years in solitary confinement sharpened the hearing. The look of a man, she said, who has been enclosed for a long time in a tomb. No man but I could know how truly the lady had spoken. If to live in darkness for twenty years, in darkness and silence, underground and alone, if this is to dwell in a tomb, then the Count of Monte Cristo had dwelt in a tomb. I alone can speak of these things, for I alone know the true name of the Count of Monte Cristo. It is mine. It is Edmund Dantes. The story of Edmund Dantes begins in 1814, the year the Emperor Napoleon was a prisoner in Elba. It begins with a wedding... Edmund Dantes. Edmund Dantes? He's my son. What do you want of him? Edmund Dantes, in the name of the law, I arrest you. Arrest me? What have I done? I cannot inform you. You'll be duly acquainted with the reason for your arrest at your first examination. Do you hear that? He's done nothing wrong. He's my son. He's a good boy. Edmund Dantes, you're under arrest. Follow me. Your name? 
Are you the king's prosecutor, sir? Yes, yes. My name, name is Edmund Dantes. You will kindly give me all the information in your power. You have served under the usurper Napoleon? No, sir. Edmund Dantes, it is reported that your political opinions are extreme. My political opinions? Alas, I never had any opinions. I'm hardly 20, sir. I was to be married today. What do you I... make of this? It is a letter, Monsieur Dantes. Well, read it. The king's prosecutor is hereby informed by friends of the throne and religion that one Edmund Dantes, mate of the ship Pharaoh, arrived this morning from Smyrna, having touched at Naples and the Isle of Elba. He has been entrusted by the usurper Napoleon with a letter to the Bonapartist Committee in Paris. This letter will be found on his person or at his father's or in his cabin aboard the Pharaoh. Oh, sorry, sir, I don't understand it. You know the writing? No, sir. Well, whoever wrote it writes well. Have you any enemies? Not that I know of, sir. Now, answer me frankly. Not as a prisoner to a judge, but as one man to another. Is there any truth in this accusation? No, sir. I swear by my honor as a sailor, oh, go sir. go on, go on. The day after we left Naples, when my captain lay dying, he gave me a package to be delivered on the island of Elba. What did you do with it? What should I have done? What every man would have done in my place. I sailed for the island of Elba. I delivered the packet and was given in return a letter to be delivered to a man here in Marseille. I did exactly what my captain told me to do, sir. I landed here yesterday. That's all, sir. I see. Well, it sounds like the truth. Now, you give up this letter you brought from Elba and give me your word that you will appear at your call and you may go back to your friends. I'm free then, sir. Yes, but first, give me the letter. Here you are, sir. Very well. By the way, to whom were you to deliver this letter? To Francois Noirtier, this citizen. Francois Noirtier? Yes, sir. Why? You know this man. A faithful servant of the king does not know conspirators. Have you shown this letter to anyone? To no one, sir. On my honor. No. No one knows that you are the bearer of a letter from the Isle of Elba addressed to Francois Noirtier? Nobody, sir, except the one person who gave it to me. Why, sir? What's, sir? What's the matter, sir? You... Give me your word of honor that you are ignorant of the contents of this letter. Oh, my word of honor, sir, but... What's the matter? You're ill, sir. Can I help no, you? No, stay where you are, Edmund Dantes. For me to give orders, not you. I am sorry. I am no longer able, as I had hoped, to restore you to liberty. Before doing so, there are formalities to be gone through. Oh, sir. I will try to make them as short as possible. Now, the principal charge against you, as you know, is this letter. You, you see what I do with it. You see, I destroy it. Now I can find it to the flame. It's beautiful, your goodness itself. Now then, do you trust me? Order me, sir, and I will obey. Hey, listen, this is not an order, but advice that I give you. Yes, monsieur. I shall keep you until this evening here in the Palais de Justice. Yes, sir. Should anyone else question you, do not breathe a word of this letter. I promise. You see, the letter is destroyed. You and I alone know of its existence. So if they question you about it, Deny all knowledge of it. I will, sir. It was the only letter you had? Yes, sir. I swear it. I swear it. Good. Now then, not a word to anyone, remember. Yes, sir. Your Honor. You will take this man to the guard room and hold him there. He is to see nobody, you understand? Nobody. Yes, sir. Follow this officer, Monsieur Dantes. Later, I will give him his orders. <laughs> Impossible. Why is it not allowed? I'm innocent. Take my advice, my friend. Don't brood over what is impossible. 
You go out of your head. Listen to me. I want to see the governor. If you don't let me see the governor someday, I'll hide behind the door, and when you come in, I'll dash out your brains with this stool. Put on the stool. Are you going to let me see the governor? Put on the stool. Put it down. Well, do I see the governor? Yes, we'll see the governor at once. At once. Sooner than you think. Hop out. Hop over the guard. Hop by the governor's orders. Take this prisoner to the floor below. The dungeon. That's where we put our madmen. The dungeon. What? Can jump. I tell you, I'm innocent. What? What? I'm innocent. I'm innocent. In darkness and silence, underground and alone. Every day, twice a day, morning and evening, the jailer came to my cell and put down the vile food and went away without speaking to me. My hair and nails had grown long, and my skin was white as a leper's. I'd been proud the first month. Now I began to beg. I begged to be moved from this dungeon to another. I begged to be allowed to walk around. I begged for books. Nothing was granted. I spoke to the jailer when he brought me my food. He rarely answered me. I tried to speak when alone, but the sound of my own voice terrified me. After what must have been three or four years, the governor of the Chateau d'If was transferred. The new man did not trouble to learn my name. I was no longer Edmund Dantes. I was number 37. I took to praying, but not as men pray in prosperity. In my prayers, I laid every action of my life before the Almighty. Still, I remained a prisoner. Then a deep gloom took possession of me, and then furious rage and savage thoughts of revenge, and wildly I dashed myself against the walls of my prison. I tore at my own flesh with my nails, and then... Then I began to think of dying. I swore I would starve myself to death. So every morning and every evening, I threw out through the small grated window all the food the jailer brought me. At first gaily, then thoughtfully, then with regret. I held the plate in my hand for an hour at a time, gazing at the morsel of bad meat, of tainted fish, of black and moldy bread. One day I found I had not sufficient force to throw my supper out of the window. The next morning I could hardly see or hear. I knew I was dying. The day went by. I felt a stupor creeping over me. The gnawing pain at my stomach had ceased and my thirst had abated. When I closed my eyes, I saw myriads of lights dancing before them. I was on the edge of that mysterious country called death. Suddenly, a little after dark, I heard a hollow sound in the wall against which I was lying. I sat up and listened. It was a continuous scratching as if made by a huge claw, some iron instrument scraping against the stones. Then all was silent. Soon it began again. Nearer and more distinct. Perhaps it was only a workman repairing a neighboring dungeon. I soon find out. The sound continued. With my earthenware jug, I knocked against the wall where the sound came. Heard me. Each time I knocked, the knocks were repeated on the other side of the wall. When I stopped knocking, the other also stopped. After that, there were no more sounds. The night passed in complete silence. I never closed my eyes. Three days passed. Three long days. And never a sound. At last, on the fourth evening, whoever it was was quite close to me now. I wanted desperately to help him, but I had nothing, no knife or sharp instrument. I smashed my earthenware jug. That night I moved my bed from the wall and started to scrape the plaster with a piece of the broken jug. Soon the fragments of plaster began to fall away. In three days I uncovered a large stone. The next day, about noon, the stone began to move. Oh, my God. My God. My God, don't fail me now. 
Who talks of God in this place? Speak again. In the name of heaven. Speak. Who are you? A prisoner. Of what country? A Frenchman. Your name? Edmund Dantes. How long have you been here? Since the 28th day of February, 1815. Your crime? I'm innocent. And you? Who are you? I am number 27. How long have you been here? Since 1804. 20 years. All that night we worked. Then... Just before dawn, a portion of the floor in my cell gave way, and from the bottom of this passage, the depth of which was impossible to measure, appeared the head, then the shoulders, and lastly, the body of the man. I know all that I've become. In the prison, he was known as the mad priest. I never learned his name. For eight years, we saw each other every day, using the tunnel he had dug through the solid rock, concealing the mouth of the passage with stones carefully fitted in place. By the sundial he had traced on the wall of his cell, we knew the hours of the guard's visit. The rest of the day, we were together. He'd been a great scholar in his day, and all that he knew, he taught me with infinite loving patience, day after day, year after year. Then one morning, when I came down, I found him standing in the middle of the cell, pale as death. Quit, Dantes, quit. Listen to what I have to say. What is it, Father? Tell me, I'm sick. I'm dying. Help me to my death. Yes, Father. You see, half of my body is paralyzed already. Careful. Yes. Oh, thank you, my son. Now listen to me. Yes, ma'am. All is over with me. This night or tomorrow, I will be dead. Oh, but father, you can. I know the illness. There is no hope. And I shall never leave this place now. Before I die, there's something I want to give you. Here. Look. It's just a burned piece of parchment. But, my child, it is my treasure. From this day forth, it belongs to you. Your... your treasure? Oh, yes. I know what is passing through your mind at this moment. Even now, you, like... like all the others. But be assured, my child, I'm not mad. This treasure exists. Have you ever heard of the great Sparta treasure? The Sparta treasure? I've heard sailors talk of it. For ten years, I worked for the house of Sparta. That paper that you have in your hand is what is left of the will of Cardinal Sparta, murdered by Rodrigo Borgia. Now, take the paper and put the two pieces together... And really, on the 25th day of April, 1498, being invited to dine by His Holiness Alexander VI and fearing for my life, I declare to my nephew, Guido Spada, my sole heir, that I have buried in a place he knows, in a cave of the island of Monte Cristo, all that I possess of ingots, gold, monies, jewels, and diamonds, which treasure may amount to nearly ten millions of Roman crowns, which you will find in the farthest angle of the island cave in this treasure, I bequeath them even entirely to him as my still there, says her spider. Ten million crowns. Yes. One hundred million francs of our money. Think of the good a man could do in the world with one hundred million francs. Yes. The treasure is yours, my son. I bequeath it to you. Whatever you are free you have only to go to the island of Monte Cristo, and it will be there for you. But I have no right to it, sir. You are my son, Dante. You are the child that 
God sent to console me in my captivity. Two days later, in fearful agony, he died. I closed his eyes and laid him out to rest as well as I could, and that night the governor of the prison came down to look at the boy. I watched him from my hiding place in the cell. Is he dead? He's dead, all right, Your Honor. Poor devil. He was a priest. Get him the newest sex we can find. What time shall we bury him, sir? The usual time, before dawn. And report to me when it's done. Very good, sir. When the cell was empty again, I went in. On the bed at full length and faintly lighted by the light of a single candle was visible a sack of coarse cloth. And in it was stretched a long and stiffened form. Quickly, I unlaced the sack drew out the cord to the priest and carried it through the tunnel to my cell. I laid it on my bed, turned the head to the wall, and covered it with a sheet. For the last time, I kissed the ice-cold brow. Then I went back to the dead man's cell. Could hear steps in the passage and voices as the guards came back with a stretcher. Quickly, I got into the sack and placed of the corpse. I laced the sack around my body. I lay stiff, hoping that they would not hear the beating of my heart. Heavy enough for an old man. Well, they say every year adds half a pound of the bones. All right. Up, oh, Chico. I got it. Here we go. Funny thing. You feel it through the sack? If dead 12 hours, you still warm. Yeah, only when I open this door. Oh, Lord, it's cold up here. This will cool him off. Have you got the weight? There it is. Tie it on. Round his feet. Yeah, that's right. Tight. If you can do it any tighter. Yeah, that's all right. That'll sink him. All right, now. You ready? One. Two. Wait. Wait a minute. Get near the edge. The last one was mashed on a rock, and we got the blame for it. All right. Come on, come on. Freeze it. Let's go. One. Two. Three. <laughs> Listening to the Campbell Playhouse presentation of The Count of Monte Cristo, starring Orson Welles. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. This is Ernest Chappell, ladies and gentlemen, welcoming you back to the Campbell Playhouse. In a moment, we shall resume our presentation of the Count of Monte Cristo. Lately, I've been speaking of the increasing numbers of good home cooks who, after years of making their own soup, have put by their kettles and are now letting Campbell's make soup for them. Tonight, I'd like you to hear from a woman who is herself one of these good home cooks. She's Mrs. Barbara Roth of 2134 24th Street, Astoria, Long Island, who has come to our studio to tell you personally what she told us in a recent letter. Will you read it now, Mrs. Roth? Ever since I can remember, we've had soup with our main meal every day. Mother and I would cook soup each Monday, Wednesday, and Saturday, a two-day supply each time. It was a big job and a long cooking procedure, but Mother has always insisted we need soup every day. About six months ago, we tried our first can of Campbell's soup. Well, the decision was unanimous in favor of Campbell's. Since that time, we've enjoyed not only the good taste of Campbell's soups, but also the easy way of preparing them. So I just don't wonder at all that people are giving up soup making at home. We've tried nearly every soup that Campbell's make and found each one such a treat, we thought you were entitled to know about it. Well, thank you, Mrs. Roth. Indeed, we do appreciate knowing about it. Certainly, we at Campbell's are devoting time and care and all our skill to the making of soups worthy of a place at your table. And that's why I want to say to every other good home cook listening tonight, we'd like to make soup for you, too. If you haven't done so already, will you give us a trial? 
Try Campbell's chicken soup, for instance, for its deep, rich chicken flavor. Or try Campbell's vegetable soup, a soup that's practically a meal in itself. If you do this and let the fine flavor of these Campbell soups speak for itself to you and your family, I'm almost certain you'll say, well, soup is one thing I no longer need make in my home. Now we resume our Campbell Playhouse presentation of the Count of Monte Cristo, starring Orson Welles. summer and fall of the year 1834, merchant vessels, plying their trade between the south of France and the coast of western Italy, arrived in port with a strange story. Some miles north of the Isle of Corsica, there was a small island known as the Island of Monte Cristo. Naked and barren, it offered no shelter for ships, no possible place for human habitation. Even the savage Barbary pirates who infested those waters were known to avoid its rock-bound, treacherous shores. From this island, a thin column of smoke was now seen rising day after day as from a fire, and a large ship was seen standing out to sea, flying no flag. On one or two occasions, when curious merchantmen attempted to approach the island, they were greeted with a cannon shot across their bows. Then one night, the ship vanished. After that, there was no more smoke. And the island of Monte Cristo remained barren and deserted as before. in Marseille, a man of about 38 or 40 of a pallor that was almost livid. He gave the impression of a man who had been enclosed for a long time in a tomb. Soon after landing, he inquired for an old man by the name of Dantes. And hearing that he had been dead for the past 14 years, he inquired for a tailor of the city called Caderousse. My name is Caderousse, monsieur. There are a few questions I'd like to ask you. Yes? What makes you think I can answer them or that I want to? This. Oh, thousand francs. Yes. <gasps> what are you doing? I'm tearing this thousand franc note in two, my friend. One half is yours now. But, but, uh... The other half will be yours when you've answered my questions. Monsieur Caderousse, in the year 1814 or 15, did you know a young sailor by the name of Dantes? Sailor? Dantes? Yes. Why do you ask? Is he alive? No. He died in prison. Died, eh? What did he die of? What do young, strong men usually die of in prison. He died of sorrow and a broken heart. Oh, dear. And here's the strange thing. To the very end, Dante swore he was utterly ignorant of the cause of his imprisonment. So he was, poor fellow. Why do you say that? Uh, for no reason. Go on. I was with him when he died. And with his last breath, he begged me when I came to Marseille to clear his name, and he gave me the names of the people who were his friends. There are three, he said, besides my father and the girl I was betrothed to. One of them is you, Caderousse. He said that? The second man is a man called Dangla. Dangla? The third is a certain Fernand Mondiego. Mondiego? Yes. You know these men? Know them. Listen. I could tell you something about those two. Not that it would do much good now that he's dead. Who? That young fellow you were talking about. The sailor, Edmund Dante. What do you mean? It wouldn't do him much good. Just what I say. Do you know who sent Dante's to prison? No. Well, I do. Two men who were jealous of him. One for love and one for ambition. And you know who they were? I'll tell you. Mondiego and Dangla. I thought they were his friends. Yes, so he thought. What did they do? They denounced him to the police as a traitor. And was he a traitor? No more than you or I. But they knew he had a letter on him from the Emperor Napoleon in exile. Something his dying captain had given him and it looked bad. Which of the two denounced him? Both. Dangla was the shot one. He wrote the letter, and Mondiego put the letter in the post. What? When was this letter written? In a cafe. The night before his wedding. How do you know? Were you there? I was at the next table. They thought I was too drunk to hear them, but I heard them. They sent the letter to the magistrate, de Villefort. De Villefort. If you knew all this when they arrested him, 
Why didn't you speak? I was afraid, monsieur. I was afraid of what they'd do to me, those two. Dangler was the sharp one, but Mon Diego was quick with his knife. Oh, often is the time I've repented it. Well, now you've told the truth at last. But Edmund Dantes is dead. He has not forgiven me. He never knew what you'd done. He knows it now. They say the dead know everything. Yes. Now then, Caderousse, another thousand francs if you tell me the truth. You say those two gave him up. Because they were jealous of him. That's right. Why? Why was this Danglard jealous of him? They were shipmates. Shipmates? How did you know that? You told me just now. Why was he jealous of Dantes? Danglard? Because he wanted his job. Oh. Yes. And they were mates together on the same ship. When the old captain died and the owners made young Dantes captain, Danglard never forgave him. And the other one, this Mondiego. What did he have against Dantes? A girl. A girl? Yes. A girl Dantes was engaged to marry. She was Mondiego's cousin, and he wanted her, too. And, well, when he got his chance to get young Dantes out of the way, he took it. I see. And now tell me, what happened to those two, Danglar and Mondiego? Do you know them still? Where in heaven's name have you been, my friend? There isn't a man in France who doesn't know them. Danglar's a millionaire, has a banking house of his own. Baron Danglar, he calls himself now. And Mondiego's a baron, too, and a cabinet minister, and an officer of the Legion of Honor with a house in Paris a block wide. They've done pretty well for themselves, they have. And you'd think they'd remember their old friends, wouldn't you? But not they. <laughs> they send the butler out with a ten-franc note. That's what they now do. Now then, tell they... me. How about this girl Edmund Dantes was betrothed to? The girl? Yes. Mercedes? Yes. If that's her name. What happened to her? Oh, that's a sad story. When Dantes was arrested, she was nearly mad with grief. Pitiful it was. Six months went by and there was no news of him. And every day there was her mother telling her that he was dead and telling her to marry Mon Diego. She used to come to see old Dantes. Edmund is dead, he said to her. If he weren't, he would have returned to us. Then the old man died and left her quite alone. Still she waited and still no word from him. Then, in the end, after a year, she married Mon Diego. Now she's one of the greatest ladies in Paris. A year? She waited a year? What'd you say? Uh, nothing. Nothing. You say Edmund Dante's father died? Yes. Soon after his son disappeared. What did he die of? Well, yeah, if you want to know what I think, he died of starvation. Starvation? The doctor had another name for it. But I know better. He locked himself up in his room and died of starvation. Later that day, the stranger appeared at the town hall and asked to see the prison records for the year 1815. He obtained permission to go through the case of a certain Edmund Dantes, imprisoned that he unsubsequently reported as dead. He read the examination and record and noted with surprise that the name of Francois Noitier, to whom the fatal letter had been addressed, never once appeared in it. There was a notation in the margin which read as follows, Edmund Dantes, an inveterate criminal, be kept in complete solitary confinement and to be strictly watched and guarded. It was signed Francois Noitier de Villefort. Below, in another hand, was written, prisoner killed while attempting to escape. That night, the stranger left Marseille going north. Danglard Villefort. Mon Diego. Danglard. De Villefort. Ali? Yes, Master. Here are 100,000 francs. Spare no expense. Find out everything there is to know about those three. Every move they've made, every word they've said, every line they've written. Yes, Master. Find out about their homes, their wives, their children, friends. Yes, Master. Find out where they got their power, how they made their money, whom they robbed, whom they cheated. Whom they murdered! Yes, 
One day in November, Baron Danglar, head of the banking house of that name, received a visit from a new client. I have the honor of addressing the Count of Monte Cristo. You have, Baron Danglar. Have you been in Paris long, sir? Since this morning. I have a letter here, sir, from the firm of Thompson and French in Rome. A letter of credit in your name. Good. Then I take it beginning today, my checks will be duly honored by your house. In this letter, there is one thing not quite clear. Indeed. According to this letter, the Count of Monte Cristo is to have unlimited credit on our house. And what is there in that simple fact that requires explanation? Merely that term, unlimited. Are you suggesting that Thompson and French are not looked upon as solvent bankers? Oh, no, no, no. It was not their solvency I spoke of, but the word unlimited in financial affairs is so extremely vague a term. To me, Baron, the word means exactly what it says. It means... Without limitation. Well, I assure you, sir, that up to the amount of a million... I beg your pardon. I assure you, should you at any time be hard-pressed, were you even to require a million francs... One I million? Why, <laughs> Baron, I always carry one or two million in some corner of my pocket. Expect me to call on you for ten or fifteen million on my first draft. Well, I admit I have hardly been... A if you would prefer not to handle this account, Baron Dangler, I have letters similar to yours addressed to Bearings of London and Baron de Rothschild of the city. You need have no scruples in declining. I assure you, I never entertained... No, 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 no. You merely wish to be convinced that your stockholders ran no risk. Nothing more. Very sound, Baron Dangler. I understand they include some of the greatest names in France. Am I right? The Count de Mondiego? Eh? The Baron de Villefort? It is not generally known that... Oh, of course. Of course. Of course. Now we understand one another. I should like to draw tomorrow the sum of, shall we say, six million francs. Half gold, half notes. Six million francs? As you say... If I should require more, I'll let you know. Oh, by the way, buy me tomorrow 10,000 shares of Austrian Commonwealth. Oh, you have some information, sir, about uh, this stock? You will find, sir, that I never gamble... Except in certainties. One, two, three. Tangla view for Juan Diego. Ali. Yes, master. What have you found out about these men? One, Dangla. Dangla, banker. Three times bankrupt. Convicted of using charity funds. Recently suspected of plunging heavily with the funds borrowed from his own bank. Two, De Villefort. De Villefort, formerly King's agent in Marseille, where acted as Bonapartist fire under the name of Francois Noirtier. Francois Noirtier. Known to accept bribes. At present, prosecutor general of King's Court. Said to speculate with funds borrowed from Dangla Bank. Three, Juan Diego. Juan Diego, dismissed from naval service for theft. Tried for murder, 1816. Deserted French army, 1824. Believed in vast heavy losses. Dangla Bank. Dangla. View for... Juan Diego. One. Two. Three. Well, gentlemen, you're late, Bill what is it, Dangler? You sent for me in court. I hope it's something good this time. We need it. That's arrived. A private message for the Count of Monte Cristo from the firm of Thompson and French from Rome. They've never been wrong yet. Does he know we intercept his messages, Dangler? Who cares? What does it say? Read it, man. A secret treaty has been signed tonight. Anglo-Italian shares due sharp rise. Buy all available shares. Thompson and French. Well, we are going to buy. Dangler, I'm worried. Everything we've touched has gone wrong lately. Those Belgian bonds we bought, we lost half a million Who's on Who's is that? On whose information were they bought? Can I help it, Danglars? The government changes Those its mind. Gentlemen, gentlemen. Our situation is desperate. We've got to plunge. We have no choice. If it were not for the count of Monte Cristo's deposits, we'd have been bankrupt three weeks bankrupt. ago. Yes, you understand that? Bankrupt! If that money should be called for today or tomorrow or the next day, this bank is ruined. Danglars, I don't see what that has to do with us. You don't. You don't, eh? Well, if I go, you go. All of you. Make no mistake about that. Oh, gentlemen. What do you propose to do about this, Dangler? I propose to buy every share of Anglo-Italian that comes into this market. <laughs> With what? With what? You forget, gentlemen, that the Count of Monte Cristo has 16 million francs on deposit in this bank. Oh, yes, I see. Well, what about this message of his? Does the Count of Monte Cristo get to see it? This message, gentlemen, was lost in transmission. <laughs> Buy 300 shares of Anglo-Italian. 
than it was that winter by the mysterious Count of Monte Cristo. His wealth seemed inexhaustible, and it was said that for his carriage wheels alone he had paid one million francs. It was at the end of December that a great ball was given by the Baron Danglars. Count of Monte Cristo. Countess de Montego. We have missed you. In so short a time, madame. A strange thought occurs to me. Yes, madame? It seems to me that you've been gone longer than I can say. It's an odd idea, Count, but I... I cannot shake it off. You must think back, madame. Perhaps some half-forgotten moment in your past. My past is not forgotten. No? Then it is lost. What's lost? What have you lost? Who are you? You must forgive me, Countess. I have an appointment with your husband. Tell me who you are. Madame, I am the Count of Monte Cristo. And the world is mine. Congratulations, Dangdow. I got your message. Good day's work. Tell me, how much did we buy of Anglo Italian? 62,000 shares. Six. Yes. How much profit does that show? So far, Mon Diego, three million. Three million? Three million, yes, and it's only a beginning. Who is selling? That I don't know. I couldn't find out. Baron Dunder? Yes. Count of Monte Cristo would like a word with you. Uh, tell him, tell him I can't see him. Good evening, gentlemen. A charming party. I hope I do not intrude. <laughs> Dunder. De Villefort. Mon Diego, how fortunate. Gentlemen, I'm here to say goodbye to all three of you. Goodbye. I've decided to leave Paris for a while, perhaps forever. Before I go, there are certain things I've left to do. Donald Angler, I'm in need of money. My credit on your money? books as of tonight is 16 million francs. That's about 4 million to cover certain stocks I sold short today. Oh, so. Here's a check for 10 million francs made out of cash. My carriage will be at your bank at 9 o'clock. I'll take half in gold and half in notes. But surely... I beg your surely, pardon. Surely, sir, such a very large sum. Yes, a very large sum. If you could conveniently wait for this money for 24 hours, or at the most, 48... I have told you, Baron Dangler, I am leaving Paris in the morning. Oh, oh, by the way, Baron, you will be interested to learn that less than an hour ago, Anglo-Italian went into liquidation. What? Yeah, liquidation. <laughs> this moment, that stock is worth less than the paper on which it is printed. The message. The message from Thompson and Fett. That message was sent on my instruction three days ago. You see, gentlemen... I own Thompson and French. But isn't it true about the treaty? As far as I know, Mon Diego, there was not any question of a treaty. Yes, that it means... means that you three gentlemen are ruined. It means that you, Gangla, have robbed the poor and the helpless for the last time. I'll prosecute you with this. I'll issue a warrant for your arrest. I don't think you will, Baron de Villefort. In the first place, that message was addressed to me. In the second place, since noon today, there has been in the hands of the Minister of Justice a complete record of the career of Francois Noitier, also known as Baron de Villefort. Spy, Stop. thief, forger, Stop. informer. Who are you? Who am I, Montego? Still, you don't know. I know you very well, Fernand Montego. And tomorrow all Paris will know you for what you are. Deserter, traitor, murderer. Who are you? What have we done to you? What have you done to me? You condemned me to a slow, horrible death. You killed my father. You deprived me of love, of freedom, of happiness. What is your name? I have but to pronounce it, Mon Diego, to strike you to my feet. Look at me, Fernand Mon Diego. I am the specter of a wretch you buried in the dungeons of the Chateau d'If. 
You oh, guess it now, do you not? Or rather, you remember it? For notwithstanding all my sorrows and my tortures, I show you now a face which the happiness of revenge makes young again. A face you must often have seen in your dreams since your marriage, Fernand Mondiego, with Mercedes, my betrothed. What? Yes! I am Edmond Dantes. <laughs> Countess Mondiego. Yes, Count. Your husband has been detained. There are matters of urgency which will not permit him to leave this house. May I see you to your carriage? Yes, Count. I asked you a question. I wonder if your answer was the truth. Madame? The girl who made you suffer. I asked if you had forgiven her. Yes. Yes, I've forgiven her. And those who separated you, do you still wish to punish them? Madame, they have been punished. But my answer is still the same. It is not I who punished them. It was their own past. our Campbell Playhouse presentation of the Count of Monte Cristo, starring Orson Welles. In just a moment, Orson Welles will return to the microphone. Just now, I'd like another word with you on something good to eat. You know, I really believe your very first spoonful of Campbell's chicken soup will be a revelation in how fine, how deep in chicken flavor a chicken soup can be. I'm prompted to say this because I know so well from having visited Campbell's kitchens what good things are in this chicken soup and how carefully it's made. To begin with, unlike most chicken soup made at home, Campbell's use not some, but all the choice meat of selected plump chicken. But apart from this one advantage, they follow closely the old home way of making chicken soup. They simmer the broth long and slowly till every golden drop is rich with chicken flavor. And then they measure in light fluffy rice and add tempting pieces of tender chicken meat to complete your enjoyment. Now, doesn't that sound like a chicken soup you'd enjoy? <laughs> I really believe it is. And so I say, just as sure as you like chicken, you like Campbell's chicken soup. Have it tomorrow, won't you? And now, here is Orson Welles with news of next week's story. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, here it is. The native quarter, known as the Casa. As you look at it here, it's just a few lines on the map. But the reality is something stranger than anything you could have dreamed. It's only a step from the modern city to the Casa. But when you take that step, you enter another world. A melting pot from all the sins of the earth. A crawling anthill, a jungle of houses. A labyrinth of narrow passages and winding alleys. Rotten with vermin and decay and the filth of centuries. No one knows what mysteries are hidden behind those walls. No one knows what crimes and hopes are buried in those secret courtyards. 40,000 inhabitants from all over the world. Chinese. Gypsies and Shekos, Slavs far from home, and Maltese, Negroes from every corner of Africa, Sicilians, and Spaniards, hot-blooded and quick to hate, and women, women of every age and of every shape, women caught in the net of the Casba, the Casba which rises like a fortress from the sea, colorful, sordid, and dangerous. There isn't just one Casba. There are hundreds, thousands. And in that labyrinth, Pepe El Moco is at home. And he 
safe as long as he stays there. And uh, that, ladies and gentlemen, is the introduction to next week's broadcast. It's what Detective Flamaine tells the detective from Paris about Pepe Lamoco, one of the greatest criminals the world has ever known, who found himself one of the most successful hideouts a criminal ever unearthed. The Cosba, that ought to do for the Oriental music. And now, ladies and gentlemen, the Cosba is the scene of next week's broadcast. The title, which we have neglected to mention, is the name of one of the weirdest, wildest places on the globe and one of the best romantic adventure stories ever put on the screen. Algiers. You remember it from the French picture and from Walter Wanger's wonderful American picture. Our guest next week, the lovely Paulette Goddard. Please join us. Until then, until next Sunday night, until the Cosba and Pepe de Moco, at the same time, my sponsors, the makers of Campbell Soups, and all of us on the Campbell Playhouse remain, as always, obediently yours. Tonight's Campbell Playhouse production of The Count of Monte Cristo. Orson Welles played the part of Edmund Dante, The Count of Monte Cristo. The part of Caderousse was played by Ray Collins. Everett Sloan was the Abbey Faria. Frank Reddick was Villefort, and George Colotis was Dangla. The part of Mondiego was played by Edgar Barrier, and that of a jailer by Richard Wilson. Agnes Moorhead played Mercedes. The music for The Campbell Playhouse is arranged and directed by Bernard Herman. The makers of Campbell Soups join Orson Welles in inviting you to be with us at the Campbell Playhouse again next Sunday evening when we bring you our adaptation of that colorful and successful motion picture story, Algiers, with Orson Welles and Paulette Goddard. Remember, Campbell Playhouse, next Sunday evening. Meanwhile, if you have enjoyed tonight's presentation, won't you tell your grocer so tomorrow when you order Campbell's chicken soup? This is Ernest Chappell saying thank you and good night. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.